Welcome everybody. I hope you're all safe and doing well. Uh, I wanted to do my take on trends in a bit of a more long form version. So uh, here I am on Tyler Spain's Facebook Live and YouTube channel. Uh, please make sure that uh, you hit that like button and, and share it with anyone that you know. Um, we'd love to get this, uh, this content out there to as many people as we can. We're going to go over the macro trends that I see that, um, that are really kind of pervasive, that, that really fit within the design language of all the tile compositions that we're doing this year. Um, and, and as I think, it's, it's going to evolve from here as normally does with trends. So these kind of macro trends are things that you can keep in mind for the next couple of years, I think. Then we're going to get into chroma or color theory, what, uh, what sort of, what's trending in terms of the color palette and how that's affecting the kind of programs that we're doing. Um, and how it all fits together in terms of what colors we're using in our compositions. Uh, and then finally, we're going to talk about some really key points that are specific to tile um, because everything else really kind of flows through everything that we're putting into our buildings today. Uh, and, and the last section is, I call it one completed thought, which is where I think we're really going in terms of trends in tile. And we'll see what I mean when I get there. So when I'm doing trend research, I always look at absolutely everything else. I look at every other field that could be interesting in terms of trends, from movies to podcasts to art that we're seeing. What kind of dishes restaurants are doing? Where we're going for vacations, the kind of books we're reading, everything that we're exposed to every single day, because that's what starts to build our list of preferences. And if I look at everything other than tile, it starts to build this multi-layered view of what the 2020 mindset is and, and what we're going to find appealing today. And then that's when I start delving into tile and looking for the connections and we'll get to what those connections are in just a sec. But um, this, this quote by Barnett Newman, you'll see that abstract expressionism. Barnett Newman was uh, an, a, not, uh, a painter in the abstract expressionist movement. He was also a writer. Uh, and I thought he had such a great um, sort of turn of phrase in a lot of his writings, but this quote specifically kind of fit with what's going on in design today. And in the 1950s, when abstract expressionism was sort of coming up, they were coming out of crisis after crisis and just on the heels of, of World War II and, and he was talking about painting and he was saying the moral crisis of a world in shambles by the Great Dis Depression and the fierce World War. It was impossible at the, that time to create art that was kind of airy-fairy and superfluous. And I think that's very true right now. I think there's a lot of parallels and you'll see that in, in my analysis coming up between this sort of uh, post-cataclysmic society uh, of, of the 1950s, previously in the 1920s, uh, and we'll see a lot of linkages there with what's going on today. So first we're going to talk about the sort of ubiquitous themes or macro trends that I see sort of translating across every look that we're doing in tile today. Uh, and, and moreover, just in interiors and exteriors, our building language in general. So we're going to go through five macro trends. We're going to go through uh, number one, maximalist evolution into, as I said, with Barnett Newman's quote there, a transition to a more abstract expressionist style, and I'll explain that. Then we're going to get into aftermath mashup, the sort of these decades that were characterized by the cataclysms that came before. Um, and we'll see uh, as, as Lindsay was saying um, in our trends panel, it's going to be really interesting to see how these trends kind of evolve and develop given what we're all going through right now with uh, COVID-19. So 
We're going to talk about the aftermath mashup of, of those two specific decades, the 1920s and 50s, coming into our design language today. Then we're going to talk about uh, how our color space, and especially the finish, is changing. How we're getting much narrower in, uh, in our colors and, and hyper, hyper matte. So I call that one chalk it up to progress. Then we're going to touch on how, what constitutes luxury today. What, what interests us in terms of a luxury product uh, and how luxury is much more personal and actually has to tell a story. And then finally, uh, very, very poignant for ceramic tile, our connection with the earth, given that tile is a, a completely natural material and really is just baked dirt. Uh, this terra firma trend becomes very, very important for us in tile. So the first one I want to talk about is this evolution to uh, abstract expressionism from the, the maximalist trend that we saw last year. And you see in, in the tile compositions that we're seeing, we're, there's a lot of synergy with maximalism. There's a lot going on. We're mixing up a lot of different colors and patterns, but what I think how this becomes a more evolved sort of design language or style is everything has a reason and it's mostly to invite thought and discussion for the people that are that are utilizing the space or that the space was created for so it's not just throwing all sorts of things into a composition to make it big and bold and interesting it's to make it thought provoking. And that was really kind of the backbone of um, the, the abstract expressionist design, or sorry, style. Uh, it, it was an interesting movement. It was mostly characterized by um, 1950s New York based art artists. And there wasn't one unifying design style. There were action painters, there were, um, the simple color block painters. There was all sorts of different styles and it actually translated into architecture and things like that as well. So we're seeing this focus on harmony rather than dissonance in these broadly inspired compositions, which I think lends itself more to an abstract expressionist style. And I love this quote by Jay Muser, who's, who was an abstract expressionist painter. It's far better to capture the glorious spirit of the sea than to paint all of its tiny ripples. So the focus is completely different in this style. It's more on getting the feel of the elements and, and creating a feel for the users of the space rather than trying to cram in a whole lot of stuff, um, which, I mean, is maximalism at its worst, obviously, but everything that I read, I, I always read that maximalism was simply the antithesis of minimalism. And whenever you're describing something or um, defining something by, by what it's not, it doesn't feel right to me. And, and to me, this sort of description of a space that connects and, and invites discussion has so much more of uh, a strong message than, than simply um, trying to be the, the opposite of something else. So what, what I'm seeing in expressionism is these wonderfully creative tile programs that, that can, and in some cases very much icon like epitomize this abstract expressionist kind of style with broad brush strokes and paint or swirls that we saw on the other uh, slide that's, that's sort of a mixture of stone and paint together. But these novelty, novelty collections really create space for conversation. That's what they do. That's what is the core of, of abstract expressionism. And, and it's to create a space that's unique that tells a story, that has different things to draw upon, to build layers into the space. And you'll see that as we're going through today, that layers really are, if I had to pick one thing that encapsulated what we're doing in design today, it's layers. 
and, and it's layers that tell the story. And it's, that's one of the things that made the abstract expressionist painters so interesting was that it wasn't just the medium that they were working in. It wasn't just the paint. It wasn't how Paul had splashed the paint on his canvas because the canvas was an equally interesting protagonist in his paintings. And the, that was the case in a lot of uh, the expressionist painters. And I'm seeing that today in Tile as well. The canvas, the simple platforms, the simple programs that we're doing that are the foundation of our space are becoming so important. They're so nuanced because there's so many layers going on top of them. So in this case, we've got a simple concrete, but it's not a simple concrete. It's got layers of different finish. It's got subtle texture that shifts and moves throughout the space. It's got little chips of exposed aggregate in certain areas. It's not all over. It's interesting. It tells a story. It draws you in. It makes you think about this sort of canvas as much as you're thinking about the stuff that's hitting you in the face with color and texture and pattern. So the next one that I want to get into is the aftermath mashup. And, and as I was doing my research, I kept seeing very, very iconic designs uh, of the 1920s in Art Deco, Art Nouveau, uh, both of those kind of design languages coming in, in materials. Uh, so the 1920s and, and anyone that read any kind of forecasting blogs uh, at the end of last year was seeing so many people saying that we were going to have a literal re reboot and, and rehash of the Roaring Twenties. Now, obviously, there's a lot of stuff. I, I'm sure most of you have seen the memes of, oh, you wanted 1920s? Well, there is a lot of parallels that we're seeing, but I'm also seeing a lot of 1950s. And as we kind of jumped completely away from the minimalist style, um, there are certain timeless things like mid-century modern and, and styles from the 1950s that are sort of just coming back in. Um, and this, this layer and this interplay between the two decades I find incredibly fascinating. Uh, the way that the two decades work together both in color, in pattern, in the way they interpret pattern, in this infinite super graphic style, um, it is so harmonious and, and works so well. And when you realize that both of these decades are really characterized by the fact that they came after a world war, a giant global cataclysm, um, makes me very excited for what's gonna come in this next decade, uh, because what do we find ourselves in now? So, um, I, I took a quote here from one of my favorite uh, Art Nouveau graphic designers uh, and lithograph um, artists, Alphonse Mucha. Uh, and it's, the purpose of my work was never to destroy, but always to create, to construct bridges, because we must live in the hope that humankind will draw together and that the better we understand each other, the easier this will become. I, I found that to be so poignant for what's going on today, for what's going on today in our lives, but also what's going on in design and how we're seeing this building of layers uh, with different, different periods of design building on and complementing each other. And so this pattern that's emerging is this layered style of very, very um, recognizable notes of 1920s Art Deco in the, in the texture in that beautiful white marble tile there that matches the floor. But we're seeing craftsmen and farmhouse elements added in, a mid-century modern sideboard that going with the mid-century modern uh, painting that's on the wall there. And all of them actually, we don't normally see all of that working together and yet uh, it does work absolutely perfectly today. So this pattern that's emerging is uh, these parallels between all of these different styles within these decades that are characterized by 
an optimism that is coming out of uh, an era of, of strife for the entire planet. And um, the creativity that comes out of that, that spirit of optimism, I think is incredibly engaging. And I think we're seeing it more and more in our title today. <clears throat> so the next one that I want to get to, I call Chalk It Up to Progress, and it was something that I started seeing a couple of years ago in furniture design. Um, as, as we get tired of disposable fashion in our clothes uh, and, and, and in the materials that we surround ourselves with in our homes, um, there was this lovely revival for handmade, beautiful artisanal pieces that you really can't get anymore because a lot of a lot of the, the skill is dying out. It takes a lot of time and and our time is is expensive and precious to us today. So we're not seeing a lot of these kind of vintage furniture pieces come out anymore. And there was this need to bring them into the current design language. So we were seeing all, the, all of these um, DIY and, and even companies that were uh, refurbishing old vintage cabinetry, furniture, art frames, all sorts of stuff with this hyper matte chalk paint, often in an ombre or, or gradient hue. Um, that was this narrow spectrum uh, sort of space of color and I, I saw it coming into tile this year in, in an extremely effective way so we're getting this from face on it's a hyper matte finish but you can see when light hits it obliquely it's actually got a little bit of a sheen what makes it look hyper matte is that we've got a very narrow spectrum of color and we're just playing with the saturation of that narrow spectrum hue. Um, so we've got these hyper flat tones in this matte, matte, matte finish. Um, and, uh, and it really builds, again, that theme of layers. It gives us different layers within a very tight style to play with. Um, and I, I think it works so effectively in tile today, especially in our smaller formats, but I'm seeing it in woods and marbles, and we'll see a couple examples of that. Um, obviously, it was tough to find a quote that sort of resonated with this, and I'm just going to let you guys sit with this one. I thought it did, um, just because of how nuanced this theme is, and it's, it's a quote by Nietzsche. Uh, and it's those who were seen dancing were thought to be insane by those who could not hear the music. And yes, there's a typo there. Someone else pointed it out and I still haven't fixed it. But uh, at any rate, it's, um, it does kind of fit with this theme. Uh, and I'm just going to let you sit with that and, and see how it connects for you. But what I love about how it's translating in tile today is this hyper matte finish and color tone. It's, while it is super flat, by flat I mean it's a narrow band of hue. If you look at it in color space, it's one vertical slice in 3D CIE lab color space. So we're just increasing and decreasing saturation of one very, very fine uh, range of, of tone and <clears throat> the effect is so strong uh, but but still wonderfully nuanced and here's how it winds up getting beautifully worked into our more modern tile programs and how it works so well is because we can digitally add effects like this vein here what that is, is a luster ink with metallic, both of them applied digitally, just in the vein. So we've got this hyper matte, super satin, buttery surface of this white marble. And the veins are picked out in, in uh, a gloss, a very, very high gloss pearlescent glaze that also, depending on how the, the light is hitting it, it's the metallic spectrum as well. 
So we've got this wonderfully nuanced tile today where we've got multiple different finishes that are engaging, that tell a different story depending on where we are, what lights are on in the space, uh, that have this wonderful interplay between different finishes in the environment as well. Like, you know, we've got the high gloss that resonates with the high gloss of the faucet with the glass vessel sink. We've got the hyper matte that resonates with that simple butcher block uh, countertop. Um, and, and it's all of this ability to play with layers that's making our compositions in, in design today so interesting. So I'm going to lead off with the quote on this one because it is so perfect and it's from the Madam of Luxury herself, Miss Coco Chanel. Uh, and it's that some people think luxury is the opposite of poverty. It's not. It's the opposite of vulgarity and I think that's really truly where we're getting in our luxury programs today. We see it the most obviously in marble, but also with our metallics uh, and just the way that we're designing for luxury today, that it's so uniquely personal. No one cares how much we spend on things today. People care what our connection is. And you can be forgiven or excused for spending exorbitant amounts of money on things that truly resonate with you, that tell your story, that you have for a very specific reason. And all of this sort of feeling of luxury that we're seeing today, everything that is a luxurious product that is maybe a little bit more expensive than we're used to, uh, or, or looks more expensive, is has a story behind it, invites conversation, um, has some connection for us. And we're seeing that, especially in our stones today, um, that we're actually in, in natural quarries, we're opening up quarries that have been closed for decades, sometimes centuries, because they have a very, very specific style of stone. Uh, that's very aggressive, that has sort of fallen out of the design language for a period of time. And we're, because we're so interested in story today, because what's behind a product makes so much more impact on us than simply something that is beautiful but airy. Um, so these aggressive stones are coming back in because we're getting more aggressive with our style. We're adding more layers to our compositions today. So these stones really fit within the modern design language and we're seeing that in, in all sorts of stones. The other sort of thing that is so important with luxury products today is a sort of parsimonious use of their luxury or um, their valuable materials and, and their design in general is more refined and, and a little bit more drawn back. Instead of throwing glam everywhere, it's just that little brass accent with that beautiful inlay of acacia wood and that simple floor. And anyone walking into that space can tell immediately that this is a luxury product because so much time and effort has gone in not looking at ways to embellish more, but looking at how much they can take away to leave just that perfect essence of the story they're trying to tell, uh, that it has to be a luxury product. So the last one that we're gonna go through in macro trends is terra firma. Uh, and it's, it's the story of us as humans reconnecting with Mother Earth. Um, and, and we see that more and more as different problems arise that most of them can be sort of linked back to how we're choosing to take care of this planet. So natural materials and our connection with them is deepening. Uh, our love and appreciation for noble, natural things is becoming more and more layered. Uh, and, and so, Tile itself, being baked dirt, like I said, is something that has a deep connection that is inherently a noble, natural material. 
and we've been literally skinning every building since we crawled out of caves that we could with baked dirt. Ceramics are one of the oldest building materials that we have, so we've got so much history to draw from. Um, and, and I love this quote by Picasso, who also, ironically, loved working in ceramics. Some of his work uh, in, in ceramics is absolutely exquisite. Um, and I love this because tile really is the story of earth working. And, and this quote is, inspiration exists, but you have to find it working. And it was italicized in that quote as well. It was emphasized. And um, I can think of nothing more poignant to tell the story of earth working than ceramics. And, and we're seeing this love of classic ceramics and the history of ceramics come back into the fore with the plethora of Zalige tile. And one of the beautiful things of, of the Zalige style of, of tile is that there's no ingobi or uh, covering primer coat of glaze that covers the entire body. Instead, it's a translucent glaze that invites the body to come through to the surface. The glaze protects it completely, but you're seeing hints of the body in that variation, that beautiful clay come through the glaze. And we're seeing more and more of these classic ceramicist, classic glazes, natural oxides mixed with different frits, fired with um, mindfulness and time. And we're seeing this come into our design language both in glaze and unglazed product, this, this feel of tile being natural. Of What I love is that tile has always been one of the best chameleons in, in our repertoire of design materials. And yet, people are appreciating tile just for tile today. Tile that's not trying to look like wood or metal or stone or anything else. Tile that can only be seen as tile. Uh, with wonderful glazes, with natural bodies coming through, and we're seeing that more and more. So now we're going to touch a little bit on the sort of broad scale overarching color theory and, and what's happening with uh, the chroma that we're working with today in our compositions. There is a very definite sort of trend in, in what's happening in our color palette. And overall, before I get into specifics, as we go all the way through, we're seeing that the tones are getting not pastel, but they are getting washed out. They're desaturated a couple of levels. They're a little bit lighter. And we're seeing this wonderful range of neutrals that goes all the way across the color gamut in these sort of, they're neutrals because they are a little bit desaturated. So the most important, and, and you'll notice conspicuously I've left white and black out. White and black are never gonna go away in ceramics. I figure I can leave them out of one session. Um, sort of one year's take on trends. It's not that they're not there. White and black are ubiquitous, uh, especially in pairing, but also on their own. Uh, and, and the same is true this year as, as any other year. Now, moving on from there, um, one of the most important palettes that we have uh, and, and have sort of grown to embrace, we've, we've moved out of beige being the most important and into gray. Now, that being said, we are seeing some of the beiges come in, again, in our gray palette. <clears throat> On the darkest, most saturated side, that's where we get our cool tones of grays. Most of uh, the cool grays tend to be the, our darker and more saturated. We move through the mid-tone heather, and as we start getting lighter, we start warming up. And we get into very decided warm grays that are just just verging on taupe, but not quite taupes. So our grays run the gamut from saturated cool through washed out and warm. 
Earth tones, as you saw in the last macro trend with terra firma, earth tones are incredibly important and we're seeing this revival of browns. Also think back to the 1920s and 50s that are, that are very, very strong in our design language today. A lot of browns in those. Um, so natural earth browns from brown brown, just verging on taupe, in through the deep red terracotta browns to the light terracotta browns to uh, almost a skin tone. Um, and and th that's kind of our earth palette. Every, everything in the terracotta, in the woods, it hits these natural, unworked um, tones of, of the earth and natural materials. Getting into our cools, we've got blues and greens that are both entering the scope of our neutral palette today. These are our field tiles in, in blues and greens, and, and we'll see quite a few of them as we're looking through our programs today. Uh, in washed out versions, we've got two deeper saturations and two lesser saturations. Um, and and th this is kind of, what I did when I, when I developed this actually, was blurred out images, taking the average color tone in Photoshop and started to build a color space. And, and these were the most common tones that I saw across paints, across fabrics, and across ceramics. Um, and, and most of, most of uh, them are, are from, most of the data points that I took were from actual ceramics and then I looked at everything else as well. As we move into the warm tones, we get everything from our pinks. I love this great off uh, flamingo pink, but there's our blush and nude tones, all the way to our deep red uh, coppers and oxide oxidized steels. So we're seeing that in all of our programs today, and I'm gonna show you a couple of examples. We saw that exposed aggregate earlier. Again, we've got an exposed aggregate and uh, large chip terrazzo um, in our wonderful washed out heather grays. Moving into our even more washed out warm tones on the ceiling here, we've got a large scale panel of, of gauge porcelain slab uh, in our soft warm gray, uh, almost getting into the beige tones. And then on the other end of the spectrum in our deeply saturated tones, we've got that cooled off version of gray in the deep basalts and anthracites. <coughs> Our earth tones have never been more important. They really, really kind of ground uh, a lot of our compositions today. And as we see the, the peaches, nudes, and blush tones, we start getting the revival of natural fired earth in our light and dark terracottas, in our woods, whether they're um, strong and embellished, but also in our concretes and our metals as well. These deep browns that are natural, unfinished tones of wood and earth uh, and, and stone are incredibly important in our design language coming into 2020. <coughs> our cool tones, as we can see, are starting to become neutrals. They're starting to enter our design language as, as uh, overall field colors in greens and blues, and sometimes a marriage of both, like we see in that tapestry floor there, or in our oxidized metals. Most of the oxidized metal programs today will have either a blued off or a grayed off, hyper oxidized version as well for an accent. So look for those. And then in our classic ceramic compositions as well, we're seeing a lot of these neutral tones come into our subway and small format floor collections as well. And then we get into our warm tones and that bridges, you can see it bridges everything from our earth tones with our deep, deep red terracottas moving into copper oxides and oxidized steel and then into our pinks, our blushes um, in, in small format wall, um, 
vessel sinks, and we're seeing a lot of these accents come in uh, in, in broad scale as well. <coughs> so the last thing, <laughs> ironically, the last thought I want to leave you with is that our design language is getting so precise and it's telling a story. It's inviting conversation. And when it comes to developing products for that kind of design story, um, we're not looking for panaceas anymore. We're not looking for one thing that does a plethora of things. We're looking for one completed thought so that we can pick that perfect element to do that one thing in our design that builds in layers upon everything else that we're putting in. So we're not looking for a jack of all trades. We're looking for it to do one thing and do it exquisitely. So I want to leave you a couple of thoughts that I had as I was looking through some of the sort of major themes of, of styles of tile that we're doing. And, and one of them is, especially for North America, woods are extremely important. It's been part of our history um, since we settled uh, here in, in, in America. We've utilized, much like they do, like if you look at the design language in Europe, there's a lot more clay and ceramics because it's the crucible and, and heartland of, of ceramics and, and it's what they had available for a building material. They didn't have the kind of huge uh, forest that we do here. So we characterize our design language with timber and we're falling back in love with raw, natural timber. We can see raw woods are rising, sort of knot work and strong contact contrasting grains or, or heavily um, stained or worked different woods uh, are, are sort of waning a little bit. We are seeing a lot of wider planks and, and I'm thinking that a possibility for the reason for this is uh, the rise of LVT and, and many of their planks are following the, the six or eight inch, the smaller formats. Um, so we're seeing a rise in, like you can see here, a 12 inch and greater formats of wood. There's a lot of 24 by 48s in woods as well in a lot of our parquets and things like that. I loved seeing this layering effect of visual arts coming into ceramics. Um, there are so many master artists throughout history that have fallen in love with ceramics as a medium. And, uh, and so to see the visual arts come into the sort of commercialized design language of ceramics was incredibly um, galvanizing for me. I, I, I thought it was great to see so many different graphics of, of woven art, of painted art, of hand sketched art. Uh, and, and that's really one of the most important things is all the art that we're seeing, again, has a natural feel of an artisan sitting there by hand, weaving, drawing, painting. Uh, anything that signals it's been done by hand is what we're loving in our art today. Uh, artificial or computer generated things are kind of on the wane, and we're seeing a lot of this art being overlaid on natural materials. So uh, in this case, it's a stone. It could be a wood. Uh, I've seen terracottas. There's all sorts of different examples of this where, again, just like in abstract expressionism, the canvas comes through and the art is overlaid on top. And it's the conversation between the canvas and the art itself that makes it so interesting. I'm seeing more and more as layers become important, as we get these fine gradations in color and these flat tones, texture being utilized as color. So we're not introducing color, we're just utilizing the way light is hitting the surface of that color in different ways. Uh, to create even deeper layers. So we're, we're seeing texture being used, and, and this is a great example of technology uh, and history coming together 
because we're, we're laying a digital glue and then we're using a dry granilla on top to create all of that texture. And it's in these beautiful uh, sort of overlaid tones of tone on tone color so that we get so much depth and, and richness to this program without adding a lot of, of color to it. So we're seeing a lot of micro textures layered upon each other. We've got just in this one piece, we've got about five different textures. And then if you look at the scope of the overall collection, there's hundreds. Texture is enhancing that tonal variation because light hits this texture differently than this one, than this one. And then the play of the textures together is creating further gradations of color. Uh, so texture is becoming more and more important as our mastery of technology rises. Uh, it's, it's bringing costs down to something that is so uh, hyper technological like a program like this. And we're seeing that more and more. Now, I was talking about how a lot of our colors have flattened out and, and are these narrow spectrum sort of washed out neutral versions. That doesn't mean jewel tones are gone, but it does mean that they're being utilized as that subtle punch. That sort of, it, they're not really fields as much anymore as it was the case in maximalism where we had bright oversaturated tones utilized so much. In the case now, often it's our smaller formats. They're not being utilized so much as a strong field color, but as accents uh, and punctuation, punctuation rather than the prose of a space, if that makes sense. So what I mean by that is it's that pop when you need it. It's that exclamation point uh, that sort of rounds out the composition rather than the composition itself. I think we're getting to the end here. Um, and I talked about this previously when I talked about luxury, but it's, or no, it was when I was talking about um, the chalk it, chalk it up to progress. But it's this ability to refinely use the technology at hand today with digital effects. So <clears throat> anyone that's sat in any of my other sessions knows that uh, we're utilizing not just color, but different effects, glossy inks, matte inks, sinking inks, uh, reactive inks that increase texture. Uh, different glues and different dry materials, um, again, natural minerals and, and silicates that are allowing us to decorate not just in color, but in dimension, in finish, uh, in, in all sorts of different ways. And it's, it's in our nature to get really excited when we have new capabilities, especially as creatives. Um, and we want to utilize that new technology and leverage it to create something new that no one's ever thought of before. And often we swing that pendulum a little bit too far in our exuberation uh, to utilize new, new things. And um, exuberation, not a word, exuberance. <laughs> anyway, um, so we're seeing now this backswing on the pendulum and sort of correcting a little bit so we're not over utilizing the effects we're just picking out in this case it's an oceanic limestone so just the little fossilizations are picked out in a luster ink so that as someone's walking through the space it again builds a layer it gives just a subtle nuance to that to that tile if you looked at it just in color it wouldn't be anywhere near as engaging. It wouldn't be that canvas that's gonna hold up to the strength of everything else we're gonna put around it. So we're using our effects to great, for lack of a better word, effect today, um, and, and doing it incredibly well. And I love this refined use uh, that's creating the little things. So that is the end for me today. I hope that you've enjoyed it. I hope I've given you some things to think about. Um, 
it's really hard doing this and not seeing faces out there, not having reactions uh, and expressions to draw upon. Um, so I'm doing my best, I'm sure you are too. I'm gonna leave you just with the, the suggestion that you might wanna check out tilespainusa.com um, for deeper uh, exposure to what's going on in the world of Spanish tile. We've got all sorts of CEUs on there. I do a lot of them. Um, there's articles, there's seminars, there's all sorts of different ways for you to absorb uh, content and get your continuing education credits, as well as the Quick Ship program, our press and news events, and all sorts of other things. So please hop on over to Tile of Spain USA. There's links to all of our social there. Uh, drop us a line, ask us some questions, and uh, don't be a stranger. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, I am going to bid you good day, and thank you very much for coming to join us at Tile of Spain.